again, we hadn't switched the cameras on. What's that? We haven't switched the cameras on yet. Oh, okay. Show me to rewind. Rewind. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just the first minute. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Okay, so you want to tell me when it's working? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, fine. Anyway, as you'll notice that uh, part of what we're trying to do here, at least in the first section, is we're trying to uh, emphasize the apologetic dimension of the ethical question because uh, probably uh, the most common uh, conversation one might have uh, with someone who is not a believer is probably over issues of morality or uh, goodness or rightness uh, versus uh, something that is evil or bad or uh, uh, not uh, not good and uh, <clears throat> and so when you're having that conversation uh, you obviously need to know and understand where people are coming from relative to these ideas of morality, ethics, goodness, etc. So you can more uh, appropriately sort of engage over the question of goodness and badness as a Christian. And so, uh, uh, so the, the first part of the course is really just an attempt to kind of get our bearings on where the conversation is and why the conversation is the way that it is and why this is typical of our culture, of uh, wh whatever the culture might be, Western or Asian culture or something else, uh, why there is this uh, kind of uh, constant back and forth over the issues of good and bad and uh, whose version of good and whose version of bad prevails uh, in society. And so the one of the characteristics uh, uh, or characteristics generally of the uh, kind of contemporary discussion about morality and ethics uh, seem to be that these dis these debates, these conversations are uh, uh, a unsettleable, that is, they're irresolvable, and uh, b they seem to be interminable, that is, they never end. So they tend to be irresolvable and they tend to be constant and unstopping. Uh, and so you never watch a show on the television or on the news broadcast or whatever website you read news on where you ever get a sense that the questions have been answered, that there's some resolution it's always left up in the air because they are inherently, given the way that uh, ethical questions are being drafted, uh, they are <clears throat> impossible to settle and they continue to feed on themselves and make it a, sort of an, an ongoing uh, sort of debate among people. But that isn't enough. Once we, once we establish that that seems to be the case, the, the real question is, why are they intractable? Why do they seem irresolvable? Why do they seem impossible to come to some sort of conclusion? And, uh, and what happens when people uh, deploy a, a rival conclusion uh, against someone else's conclusion? And so if, uh, if someone says, everybody has a right to die with dignity, that's a fairly popular one, especially in developed societies. Uh, doesn't everyone have a right to die with dignity? And then, of course, if you come along with a rival conclusion, uh, it all de depends on what you mean with dignity. Okay, so what do you mean by dignity? And what do you mean a right to die? Because isn't everybody sentenced to death anyway? Okay. <laughs> Uh, we're all dying, and so uh, so it's a sentence. Death is a sentence, okay, passed against us. Uh, and so, what is the question of right have to do with that? And what is the meaning of dignity when it comes to that experience of death? And so, you have these rival conclusions deployed against each other, and it makes for a, oftentimes a contentious debate among people. And uh, so what we can do here is we can take two of what I consider to be the most common 
historically and most recently, if you to illustrate the point, not to, to resolve the issue, but just to illustrate the point, and that would be the topics of war and abortion. War and abortion. These illustrate the point I'm making here that they are seemingly unsettleable, irresolvable, and continually ongoing. They seem to never end. And so if you take the question of war, take, take the question of war initially, uh, what you have are what is, is what we might call the incommensurable premise incommensurable premises, if you will. Now, incommensurable simply means they cannot cohere with each other. They are contradictory of each other, and so they are incommensurable. So don't be, don't be uh, uh, you know, frightened by the word incommensurable. It's just a word. <laughs> uh, maybe there's a better word, but that seems to be the word that I've, I've, I've kind of applied here. Uh, so, for example, uh, it's all about one's premises when it comes to morality and ethics, uh, uh, and about war here in particular. So you have the attitude that all modern wars are wrong. All modern wars are wrong. And that's rooted in a medieval theological vision. That's rooted in a medieval theological vision. Now you say, how could something medieval be modern? Well, we'll see in a minute. But this is rooted in a medieval theological vision. Or you have the attitude relative to war that only anti and imperialist wars of liberation are justified. Only anti-imperialist wars of, of liberation are justified. That's rooted in views of uh, the German philosopher Fichte and the Karl Marx. So Fichte and Marx are both the two who are most associated with this attitude about war that if, unless it's an anti-imperialist war of liberation, it is not a justified war. And then you have the third uh, premise, which is found in, say, a philosopher like Machiavelli, we've all heard of him, uh, sometimes uh, Machiavelli's point is that sometimes a great power uh, has to go to war to preserve the balance of power it needs and requires. So with Machiavelli, great powers need to establish equilibrium. So it's a balance of powers. The, premise behind which war is justified or not justified. So you have, they're all wrong, all modern wars are wrong, only anti-imperialist wars of liberation are okay, and war is something done to maintain a balance of power, which is the Machiavellian view. And you have premises that are irreconcilable. They're incommensurable with each other. They can't be matched together. You can't think fixed marks and medieval theology. And you can't think Machiavelli and medieval theology. They don't go together. So if you're having a conversation with someone who has this view about war, one of these views about war, you are going nowhere. Okay, You're going nowhere because you're not sharing the same premises about war generally. generally. So what we have then with each, each of these uh, premises is a worldview that leads to a moral disagreement. A worldview which leads to a moral disagreement. So if you take the mediev medieval theology perspective on a war, and that would be that a just war is a, one in which the good to be achieved outweighs the evils involved in waging the war and in which a clear distinction can be made and maintained between combatant and non-combatant. But medieval theology then concludes a modern war which cannot ensure that the escalation of the war won't become uh, un intolerable uh, and that the ability to distinguish between combatant and non-combatant will become impossible. Therefore, no modern war can be a just war. And therefore, we should all be pacifists when it comes to war. And so, you see how, for example, uh, the kind of what we might call the war on terror, 
would be a modern war which is unjustifiable because it's impossible to maintain a distinction between combatant and non-combatant because the, uh, the terrorists, people who are part of terrorist organizations, don't wear uniforms. Okay, so they don't wear uniforms with insignia which identify and label them as lawful combatants. So you can't tell who you're shooting when you're shooting someone. It could be could be someone totally innocent or it could be someone who's a vicious killer. You just don't know and therefore uh, you shouldn't even engage in war with people like this or in situations like this because you, you'll end up hurting too many non-combatants and there'll be too many of those who are casualties. Therefore, given the nature of that war, we shouldn't have any of those wars. Therefore, we should just be pacifists when it comes to this. That's a medieval view based on the theory of combatant, non-combatant distinction being impossible and the scope of war being uncontrollable. So then you have the view of Fichte and Marx, and that's about a war that's only justified if it's anti-imperialist waged for the purpose of liberating certain oppressed peoples. Uh, and so that view would say then that the wars between great powers are purely destructive. Uh, they're just destructive war. They're personal interest wars. They're not liberation wars. They're not against imperialists who want to dominate. Uh, and so uh, wars only that are waged to liberate oppressed groups, especially in the developing world, in the third world, are necessary and therefore would be justified uh, uh, as a means for destroying the exploitative domination of uh, which stands between mankind in general and mankind's happiness. So that would be a premise fundamental to this view of war. And then the third one, Machiavelli, this is the view which would be probably the most uh, commonly uh, discussed view vis-a-vis -vis, this is an understood rationalization for war in the 20th century and 21st century would be if you wish for peace prepare for war. The best way to avoid war is to be prepared for it and that is to build up your army and build up your military so that you make any potential aggressor a reticent to wage war against you because they would most likely be destroyed. Uh, and so <clears throat> The, uh, an inescapable part of making this clear is being prepared to fight limited wars uh, and even go beyond the maximum uh, rational level of war in order to intimidate potential aggressors from waging any kind of limited war against you, even if that were to be uh, a nuclear war if necessarily necessary. So, that's the premise behind this Machiavellian view of power and war. Now, so now once you establish that, then you have to ask yourself, what do these views have in common? What do these views uh, have in common? What do these arguments have in common? And what they have in common is they're impossible to reconcile. <laughs> they're impossible to reconcile. There's a conceptual incommensurability. Uh, the second thing they have in common is they're impersonal. Now, did you notice that? They're impersonal. There's no personal God speaking about anything here. It's purely impersonal argumentation about war. And the third thing is they each have their own history. They each have their own history. So they seem irreconcilable, they're very abstract, and they each have a very different historical origin in them. They're not coming from the same place. So first of all, what do we mean by their conceptual incommensurability or, irre or irreconciliation? Uh, if you think about it, each of those views about the morality of war is logically valid. What do I mean? I mean that the conclusions reached 
follow from the premises established. So it's logically valid. So if you're talking to someone like this, you can't talk about the illogical nature of their argument. It is a very logical argument. All three of them are very logical. The conclusions follow from the premises. But the problem is that the rival premises are such that we have no way, rationally, of weighing the claims of one against the other. There's no way of weighing rationally the claims of one against the other. Why? Why is that the case? Because each premise of these views, each premise employs some quite different normative or evaluative concept from the others. So they're making different claims of different kinds. Remember we just got through talking about the definition of terms and value terms. Okay, so what you give value to, the weight you give to that value, determines its centrality to the argument you're making. And so here we have premises employing very different evaluative concepts very different evaluative concepts. So you're talking about morality. It helps to know why one person gives greater weight to one value than another value. And that's part of your understanding of where people are coming from and where you're coming from. So what, uh, so what do we mean here then? Well, if you think about the argument of war, uh, the premises invoke justice, and innocence, remember, the ability to distinguish combatant from non-combatant. The non-combatant is innocent, right? The combatant is not innocent. And so you have premises that invoke justice, and then you have innocence. And these are at odds with premises that invoke success, the Machiavellian idea, and survival. All right, so you have t these things simply can't just be wedded together. They clearly create a tension in the way you understand war and the value, purpose, or whether there is any validity to war at all. So the thing I said also was that they tend to be impersonal. They tend to be impersonal. So, just to go back one step, if you're talking to someone about war, it is very important that we come to an agreement on what justice is. Right? I mean, if we don't, we're simply talking at cross purposes. We have to, to, come to, to come to a definition of justice, we have to equally come to a definition of innocence. What's that mean? We need to come to a clear understanding of what we mean by success. What do we mean by failure? Okay, these are all things that you can talk about or talk around without ever zeroing in on what people mean by those things. You, as a Christian, need to at least have some working definition of these things if you're going to make any sense of your view on war. And then we said it's they, the other thing they share in common is they are impersonal. They are impersonal. That is, the criteria are impersonal criteria. In other words, it, uh, it appears to be an argument which appeals to criteria which are not explicable in terms of the antagonist. Now, what do I mean by that? That when you're talking to someone about justice relative to, say, war, the person with whom you're talking is your antagonist. All right? This is a person who has a different view of war. Now, when you talk about war and justice and God, well, now that is completely inexplicable to your antagonist. Okay? What does God have to do with justice? Justice is something men come up with for whatever reason to justify whatever it is they want to do. So, if I'm going to employ God in my definition of justice, that will appear to my antagonist as what we say in philosophy, 
is a, it's called smuggling a premise into a conclusion. You've smuggled him in. So let's talk about justice. And all of a sudden, Michael goes, well, I believe God tells me what justice is. And they say, where did God come from in the conversation? Oh, well, I need to be more explicit that my view of justice is rooted in my view of God. Oh, that's different, you see. I'm talking about it purely from a world, rational, logical level. And now you're bringing God into the conversation. So that appears to that person as inexplicable. You cannot really explain God's relationship to these things. That's their view, at least. Uh, and so then what happens? If you're talking to somebody about war, and these rival premises are incommensurable, they appeal to a criteria that seems to be impersonal, what happens? Well, it boils down to willing a person to agree with you willing that person, making that person change their view. And so it becomes a conflict of will. You only believe this, Michael, because you want to believe it. I believe what I believe because I want to believe it. So we got two people who want to believe something totally contradictory relative to the question of war. So now what are we going to do? If that's where it all ends up, then what do we do? Isn't that, excuse me, isn't that the definition of war? What? I mean, uh, having very different values and uh, contradicting. Yes, values. but you need to make those values explicit, where they come from, what gives content to those values. That's usually left out of the conversation. Or if it's brought in, it's seen to be, as they say in philosophy, special pleading. You're bringing in something like God to justify an action that they would argue must be able to be justified purely on the basis of human reason, not with God's being smuggled into the argument somewhere. So it then appears to the people who are involved in the debate that it's an arbitrary thing. It's an arbitrary thing. There is no way to resolve this. It's purely arbitrary. Now, the third thing they each share in common is they each come from different histories different histories. Again, it's very important that we understand that all of these views, all of these attitudes toward war or abortion or whatever have historical origins. They come from somewhere. They didn't just happen one day out of nowhere. So the premises of these rival arguments have different historical origins. So justice, when we're talking about war and justice, where does that come from? Well, historically, not from the Greeks, except for Aristotle. It wasn't until Aristotle, which is kind of later, not as ancient as we like to think, Aristotle was the one who first brought up the question of justice and war. And that was then followed by Christianity, which likewise talks about justice. So justice has a history going back at least to Aristotle and the Old Testament and Christianity. Somehow these are people who are talking about justice relative to warfare. If you're talking about success, maintaining a balance of power, the Machiavellian, that goes back to people like Bismarck, Clausewitz, and Machiavelli. So if you're talking about that, you're using these people's ideas to justify what you're doing. And if it's about liberating oppressed peoples, then that has roots in Marx and in Fichte. That's where this came from. Before that, the, the Greeks never talked about liberating oppressed people. That was never an idea of war. The Bible isn't about liberating oppressed people. That's not a general idea in the Bible. The liberation of the children of Israel wasn't about liberating oppressed people. It was fulfilling God's redemptive purposes through His people, which meant getting them out of Egypt and getting them over here. It wasn't about liberating oppressed peoples. It wasn't that abstract. It was something very specific about Israel. So there's a different historical origin to each of these views. So that means then that there are worldview implications as well. Worldview implications. So when you talk about justice or innocence, these are aspects of your view of the world. Okay? You look at the world in a certain way where there is justice and there is innocence, where there is guilt and where there is innocence. And those then are what? They are articulated in the forms of traditions that we develop. So our traditions tend to embody these ideas of justice and innocence. 
And then these are reinforced in our practices of what the things we do. And then they're nurtured in terms of the stories we tell ourselves about these things. So in America, if you want to know what that means, you go and look at, say, at a movie like uh, Sergeant York, which was made in the 40s about a famous World War I soldier, Sergeant York, who was the most decorated soldier in World War I. And the story is basically telling us a story that reaffirms all the values that went into fighting a war. And so you watch the movie and you feel good about it. Like this was a just thing. He was doing the right thing. There were these evil people and we were the innocent people and therefore we feel good about this war. And so the movie reinforces all of those traditions and practices that make the 4th of July so important. You see, in America, the 4th of July is a celebration of something that's embedded in the tradition of the people about justice and injustice. The British were unjust, and we were just in fighting a war of revolution against the British. You see how it works. And so all of that stuff is woven into the stories we tell each other, the stories we tell our children, the books we write, the movies we make, the songs we sing. How can you not, tears can't come to your eyes when you hear the battle hymn of the Republic. In America, that was, a, that was the uh, song of the North in the Civil War, liberating the slaves. The battle hymn of the Republic. Where did the battle hymn of the Republic come from? From the book of Revelation. So it's in the Bible. So it's just all woven together in one big picture. And that's how all cultures do it. I don't know what you do in Latvia, but I know what they do in England, and I know what they do in France, and I know what they do in America. All of these stories about your past, about the wars you fought, these great generals, and all these things that were done, are all parts of the way in which you reinforce your view of war and make it justifiable. Of course it was just. It had to be just. Look at these people. They're bad. We were good. And that's how it works. So you see this worldview, which starts with a principle of justice, and then it determines how we go about accomplishing justice, and then we tell ourselves the story of how we did it. And that's the narratives we do. So you see this triangle here. It's a very important little picture, if you will. And the words don't be confused. You see at the top it says, Eus ad bellum. And then down below here it says, Eus in bello. Well, Eus ad bellum is literally nothing more than the just of war. The just of war, that is the just reason for war. And use in bello is the just, if you will, implementation of war. So we have to have a right theory of war which leads to the right way to fight a war. That's the difference. A just war must be fought in a just way. And then over here on the right, you see narratives. These are the tales, the biographies, the novels, the films we tell ourselves to reinforce our view of a just war and our view of how to fight a just war. And that, So just people don't fight unfairly. They fight fairly. So they don't break the rules of fairness when they fight the war. And so this is all indicative of the difference of worldview about what is just, what is innocence, what is guilt, what's the burden of proof, how do you affect justice, is there a limitation on how you can do that. These are all things that, are, that have to be brought to the surface if you're going to have a meaningful conversation about whether war is or is not justified. Yeah. So that they didn't die in vain. Yeah, that people didn't die in vain. Exactly. So we don't look back and go, that was all stupid or it was all ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. We go back, no, 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 no. It was, a, it was for a good reason they did this. And they did it in a good way and they died. And therefore we can celebrate that as a good thing. Okay, So it's, a, it's very important that these be brought out and brought to the surface in the conversation about war. So let's take secondly then abortion. If you take abortion, here's another illustration of what we're talking about, where the premises seem to be incompatible. They're incompatible premises. So if you're talking to someone about abortion, okay, well, how you characterize that reveals a lot about 
your basic understanding of things about life, innocence. All of these things are being brought up. Now, this is where it gets really thorny with people who have a radically different view of innocence, of justice, of whose rights trump other people's rights. I mean, all these things come out. So if you have this, you have, this is an illustration I'm giving you here, but uh, you have the attitude that all abortion is murder. It's unjust killing. All abortion is unjust killing. That's another way of saying murder. Unjust killing. So, uh, in the Old Testament, when the command, thou shalt not kill, it's not really kill generally. The word is specific to unjust killing. Unjust killing. That would be wrongfully taking the life of another. In other words, there's a rightful reason for taking someone life, but not a wrongful when you don't do that. So, all abortion is unjust killing. Secondly, you have the attitude, every woman, every pregnant woman has a right to an abortion. Now you can see we got some real conflict going on here, don't we? If I say abortion is unjust killing, and you say to me, every, woman, every pregnant woman has a right to an abortion, well, the conversation's now getting a little intense, wouldn't you say? It's getting to a point of real conflict here, because we're saying diametrically opposed things. Who has a right to unjustly kill anyone? You have a right to do it. Well, not if you believe that it's an unjust killing. You don't have a right. So then you have some abortions are justified and others are not. Some abortions are justified and others are not. So if you look over on the, uh, the uh, side there, I list out the people associated with this, uh, this premise, so to speak. Okay, And that would be largely grounded in the biblical narratives of the Old Testament and that was articulated very specifically in Roman Catholic theology in what we call Thomistic theology, Thomas Aquinas theology. So its roots are in the Bible and then more specifically articulated in quite lengthy ways in the work of Thomas Aquinas, a Roman Catholic theologian uh, who, was, uh, who would have held to the, a similar view, in fact articulated that. Then if you're talking about every pregnant woman has a right to an abortion, that comes from what we call rights theory. Rights theory. And that rights theory is rooted in the philosophy of John Locke. Okay? It's rooted in the philosophy of before John Locke there was no rights theory. Nobody ever even talked about that kind of idea. But with John Locke and following John Locke, rights theory became a dominant way of thinking about morality. Rights theory. When was it? 18th century. So then you have the third view, some abortions are justified and some are not. That is rooted in what we call the utility principle, or sometimes you'll see utilitarian philosophy, the utility principle, which means that it is useful, useful as a benefit for the majority of people at certain points in time. And so that was grounded in the philosophy of Jeremy Bentham. Again, 18th century, these are people before whom these kinds of uh, expressions and terms and ideas were simply not articulated in the sophisticated way they are through these people. So you have the biblical idea all, abor all uh, abortion is unjust killing. Then you have the idea there that everyone has a right to it. That's rights theory, John Locke. And then you have the idea that some are and some not. Therefore, it depends on the, what the majority needs might be. It's a useful thing at times. That would be Jeremy Bentham. And so when these ideas come about, they are codified, they are specified by these kinds of philosophers. You need to understand where these things come from. So now you have these rival premises which are contradictory of each other. So you have rights, John Locke, versus utility, Jeremy Bentham. That's where this debate basically comes from. Then you have justice versus freedom. I have a right. I have the freedom to do this versus what's the just thing to do? What is the right 
thing to do. Not that you might have freedom granted by government to do it, but is it the right thing to do? That's a justice question. And then the question is, how can you measure these things? Is there some scale of 0 to 100 that you can give a score to that leads you to a certain answer as opposed to a different answer? Well, there is no real scale if you're a utilitarian as to how you measure these things. How many people must be benefited by it versus how many people must not be benefited by it. So if you can say all but two people in the world are benefited by this, then a utilitarian would say, therefore, it's the thing you should do. But of course, the question is, what about the two? Okay, what happened to the two? Well, it doesn't matter. The rest of the world outnumbers the two. Therefore, the right thing to do is what the majority of the world would benefit by, irrespective of whether the few are damaged or hurt by it. And so, as a result of that, if you're talking to somebody who says, a woman has a right, or you say, well, it depends on whether it's going to bring about the maximum benefit or a less benefit, or you say, Un, uh, unjustified killing is wrong no matter what, well, you can imagine this is not going to go very far. This conversation isn't going very far. Why? Because you need to defend your view as to what is justice versus what is my right versus what is useful, what is useful to the majority. Now, that's where the debate gets to be interesting with people because now you're forcing them to be explicit about the premises they're using to justify their decisions about abortion. That's where the real argument must be taken if it's going to be a meaningful conversation about the truth or the non-truth associated with abortion. And so <clears throat> the problem is that so many of these things reduce to just shouting matches just arguing for argument's sake uh, and never really making any progress or coming to any conclusions, then people begin to say that moral arguments are irrational. They're just irrational. That is, the, that is becoming more and more the prevailing view in Western society. Therefore, we must not bring moral things into the discussion. That leads to argument and disagreement. It's got to be something justifiable on the basis of something else. It can't be about that. And so moral arguments are now seen to be pretty much irrational. So people, if you bring up God into the conversation or justice based on what God says is just, you're considered to be uh, uh, an unwilling and, a, and, a, and a, uh, if you will, uh, an unproductive partner in the conversation about abortion. Leave that stuff out of it. We need to think about the species, the human species, the survival of the human species, or the beneficial survival of the human species. It has nothing to do with morality, ethics. It's all about just survival, whatever that might be. And that ends up making morality and ethics something purely arbitrary. It's purely arbitrary, based on where you were born, who taught you when you were a child, whether you went to Sunday school, whether you read the Bible, whether you came under the influence of monks or monasteries, or whether you came under the influence of philosopher kings or whatever it might be. It has nothing to do with true or false anymore. And so what the result is when you talk about abortion, and the same thing would be true about war, is people begin to get a sense that it's really arbitrary. You really can't know. No one can really know. It's purely arbitrary. You're making a choice based on things that no one can fully understand and can't be rationally argued for. So it's purely arbitrary. Which means that you shouldn't try to convince someone of your position. You should never try to convince someone of your position. And that leads to a silencing of conversation about the issue of war or abortion. You simply don't talk about it because you can't convince anyone rationally of your position. It's impossible. It's purely arbitrary. And so that means that abortion is legal 
if the power is invested in people who think it should be. So it becomes a political question, not a moral question. It's purely political because politics is power. And whoever has the power to impose a view is the person who prevails in the end. So if the political establishment says we shouldn't discuss this anymore, then we won't discuss it anymore. So that's the end of the conversation. It's a political approach to the problem. And so there's all sorts of instability, personally, individually, and corporately, but it's suppressed because politics says all you're doing is creating a crisis, and crises are bad, and therefore we shouldn't have those kinds of crises, so let's don't talk about it anymore. You can hold your view, you can have it privately, you can talk about it in your Sunday school class if you want to, but whatever you do, don't bring it into the public square. Don't talk about it outside the doors of the church or your house. Keep it to yourself because all it will do is create conflict and violence. So don't talk about it. And that's where we pretty much are in Western society. You don't talk about it very much because it simply boils down to an argument that has no end. So the question then is what produced this kind of situation? What produced this kind of situation when it comes to talking about morality and ethics? <clears throat> and that, it seems to me, is a, a, a very important question because it makes us understand where these ideas come from. Where these ideas are coming from. Why have we reached a point where this seems to be the prevailing attitude about morality and ethics? How is that happening? Why is that happening? Why is there so much fragmentation when it comes to the questions of morality? There are so many radical disagreements about morality. How did this happen? And <clears throat> The, the answer for most people is, that take the American model. The American model is shut up and just put on the mask. And the mask is we all legally abide by the rules, whatever those rules are. And if that means uh, uh, unfettered abortion, then it's unfettered abortion. You may not like it, you may be unhappy about it, but you just put the mask on and just do your job and go to work and go to church and do all the things you do, but you don't talk about it. Because if you talk about it, you make a crisis out of it. And that leads to argument, which leads to violence, which is blowing up abortion clinics or killing abortion doctors or whatever it might be. That becomes the reason why you don't do anything. You don't say anything. Because you're looking for a consensus that leads to peace and not conflict. Peace and not conflict. And that's the American now. That is the prevailing view in America. You can have a view, but you don't need to make a big deal out of it. Just have it, live it, and then don't talk about it that much. The more you talk about it, the more you make it a problem. And that is the image of the American. You wear the mask, which pretends to be unified, but down underneath there are all these very different attitudes and views about it that are percolating all the time. And it's only a question of time as to when one boils to the top or one explodes over here. But the prevailing view is don't talk about it. Just keep your mouth shut and go on and be, pretend to be the happy-go-lucky American that you really are. Okay, well, before we take a break, any questions about that? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you go back to your... <coughs> Yes, as Eric Burden said, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. I'm just kidding. Remember that song? You don't remember? I'm dating myself. Okay. 40 years ago, it was a big hit. War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. Say it again. War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Say it again. Say it again. War. Okay. All right. It was a big hit when I was a kid. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the question is, he gave us uh, uh, this Machiavelli uh, and, uh, and Fict and Marx, and, medieval, uh, Marx yeah. And so uh, but what's the biblical view of the war? Well, we haven't gotten there yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's the uh, commandment: "Thou shalt not kill." That's where war comes up: "Thou shalt not kill." 
Yeah. So well, we're going to talk Yeah, well, it's in the slides, in fact. If you want to go ahead, you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, if the modern discussion on ethical topics, let's say, is so scattered and so contradictory in itself, mm -hmm. and uh, if the, let's say, biblical uh, argumentation is keep, kept outside of the discussion, uh -huh. it's not place uh -huh. talking this. Is it some, is there some way how to uh, inject it in, uh, without uh, getting shot, yes. <laughs> getting arrested? Without saying, without appearing to be divisive, to be divisive. Uh, yeah, is that possible? Yes, it is possible, but the only way it's possible is to uh, expose, and I mean that in a good way, expose the uh, inadequacy or the insufficiency of all the other ways of talking about morality and ethics, showing their weaknesses, if you will, that, uh, that if you begin to talk to a person about their view on any particular moral topic, then uh, your goal is to make them bring to the surface all of the hidden assumptions that make their view seem intelligent. It makes it seem right. And your goal is to indirectly help them see how inadequate that view is for making sense of morality, making sense of moral judgments. But you see, that's a process that takes place through time. It's not something you can just do like that. So that means that we need to be involved in conversations with people over time about issues like morality, whatever that subject might be of morality. And so then you can show how really the only truly adequate way to understand our morality as people, as individuals, and as societies is by taking into serious consideration what God made us for, why He made us the way He did, and how far from His ideal type for us to be we've come from our sin and our sinfulness, and therefore the only way back is through a great work of salvation which Christ Himself makes available to us. So it's bringing a person to Christ, to God, to the Gospel, to then re reassess all of those things that they've been believing which turned out to be not true. They're not true. And most people most people will, after a while, begin to sense the inadequacy of their explanations. If you press them enough, they will begin to see the inadequacy of it. And they'll go, well, you're right, that's not really that consistent, is it? No, it's really not. It's, uh, it's like talking to someone who's a pacifist, and uh, someone breaks into their house and puts a knife to their wife's throat. All right? Now, what's a pacifist supposed to do? Nothing. Right? You're against violence. But what does the average pacifist whose wife's got a knife to her throat do? He attacks the man with a knife to her throat. And all of a sudden he's going, I'm acting inconsistently with everything I say I believe. And that's a pretty significant... In fact, I have seen this before. I had a good friend in college who was a devoted pacifist until someone broke in his house one night. I mean, it's a true story. Someone broke into his house and tried to kill him. And he fought back. And it was a traumatic event in his life. He found himself fighting for his survival. And he thought, I convinced myself that it would be better to die than to fight back against someone who threatened my survival. And here he was fighting back against someone who threatened survival. And he ended up killing them. And he had, almost had a nervous breakdown over the whole thing. And I'm going, let me explain to you why what you did <laughs> is not irrational. In fact, it's very rational. It's very reasonable because you were made with a self-survival instinct by God. That's how He made us. And that extends to those who are weak. Our provision for 
safety to the weak. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So I would protect myself and I would protect you. Because if it's good for me, it's good for you. If my not being killed is good, you're not being killed is good. So it extends to your brothers and your sisters as well. So it was a massive upheaval in his thinking and philosophy to have to come to terms with the fact that he had struck out like that to protect himself from being killed. And I would say you discovered in a moment the truth that was there all along. You've just been living in denial of it. So you could have had a conversation with him till you were blue in the face, till you ran out of oxygen, and you would have never been able to convince him that pacifism was not an appropriate philosophy of life. But real life crashed in on him. And all of a sudden, real life awakened him to something he had never been prepared for. So it's a slow thing. It's a process thing. But it's nonetheless something you need to do is to try to bring a person to see the futility, the inadequacy of their explanations for morality as it applies not only to themselves but to their brothers, their sisters, their parents, their children, their friends. It isn't just about me. It's about the collective, the corporate people. And that's, that's where you can take a person. Let's stop for a break again. Sorry we went about 10 minutes over, but uh, we'll stop for a break and then come back. Oh, cool.